Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Professor K.J. Vinoy. I will uh, talk to you about uh, microfabrication technologies, uh, various aspects about it. Let us uh, start with uh, microsystems. Uh, you have seen in the previous lectures uh, various aspects about this. These are essentially miniature devices or array of devices that uh, usually have parts with electrical and uh, sometimes mechanical uh, and these operate with these electrical and oper mechanical operational principles. And there could be sensors, there could be actuators and in most of these there are uh, there is some kind of an energy conversion which is usually electromechanical. So, and these are you know smaller and uh, multi more multifunctional devices and these compared to the conventional ones are faster and less power consuming and more importantly cheaper devices. And one of the very popular terminology for this is MEMS, microelectromechanical systems and it could mean micro systems, micro mechanical systems, micro machine systems and all these terminologies are used in various parts of the world with a somewhat similar meaning. But we will try to stick to micro systems during these lectures. <coughs> these are essentially fabricated uh, using extended IC fabrication processing technologies and in fact with today's technology either a top down or a bottom approach bottom up approach could be possible to fabricate many of these and we will see these fabrication approaches in today's and some of these subsequent lectures in this program. Uh, first, let us have a relook at why miniaturization is required in this particular context. Uh, one of the key uh, is in terms of uh, you know getting redundancy and so that you know when you have these arrays, uh, this comes as a important feature. Uh, another important aspect is integration with electronics. So, that when we build this mechanical uh, parts or electromechanical parts, these could be integrated with electronics required and that would all simplify the system requirement point of view and enable uh, multipoint measurements. Uh, the another uh, requirement uh, or another possibility that come up with this is uh, miniaturization. Uh, with miniaturization is essentially scaling and you will see more details about this elsewhere in this program. Uh, essentially with scaling with, the, with this kind of size scales we should be able to make use of newer features and also get you know faster devices with uh, improved performance from various aspects including thermal management. And obviously when we make miniaturized devices we, there is a strong possibility that the selectivity, sensitivity, dynamic range and accuracy of measurement and all those things could be improved by that. Um, and we will, we are likely to get cost over performance advantages because of miniaturization. Uh, we should be able to exploit new effects because of you know the size scales once again and uh, you know less material consumption because of the you know smaller volume consumed in fabricating this and in many instances as you may have seen elsewhere these uh, result in devices which are minimally inversive. Uh, it is also possible to fabricate many of these when they are small using uh, approaches such as self assembly and uh, nanochemistry, uh, more intelligent materials possible with that to, uh, to build small structures at this nano scale. One of the very popular examples uh, of uh, this is micro accelerometer as you may have seen elsewhere. Uh, these have mechanical sensing elements 
and associated electronics and you know signal conditioning circuits, amplification and you know uh, even control circuits built in. And uh, there are examples, one of them is the analog device as ADHL device and this is one of the schematic of that which as you could see from here there is a sensor and a large uh, number of you know components required in the electronics are all integrated on board in this particular case. Um, compared to microelectronics as you could uh, guess you know micro systems will have more of uh, quite often moving parts and these uh, should be able to uh, sense and from the environment. So, there are several you know challenges in building systems uh, based on this. You know, in microelectronics, you have everything. Uh, you know, all kind. Of, we can build control circuits. You can build, you know, uh, condi signal conditioning circuits, amplifying circuits, and all those in microelectronics. One key, you know, thing that is missing in this is that there is really there's nothing that is actually moving. And without uh, the power to act, it may not be always possible to control, let us say, what is happening around you. And this is a typical scenario in, let us say, a, you know, a, a primary school classroom when the teacher does not have the stick with him, you know, he may not be able to control the kids. So, the circuit or that you are building, if it does not have a block which can actually, you know, move in many situations when it is you know interacting with the environment it is you know less let's say power less powerful so we need to build circuits we'll, we need to build chips which have these moving parts and that is essentially the challenge in terms of microfabrication let's look at you know a comparison between what is uh, usually done in IC fabrication technologies and let us evolve what is required for micro systems fabrication. In IC technologies, we are essentially trying to miniaturize that is essentially the trend by bulk producing and all these have resulted in um, building chips at much lower cost. But in micro systems, as I mentioned, we need to build in these additional features for various sensing and actuation applications and with moving components with obviously requiring you know additional fabrication processes. And in this way, we should be able to miniaturize uh, the entire system possibly within a package or even within a chip. So, in microfabrication technologies, the objectives are essentially to like in ICs, miniaturize and bulk produce so that we res it results in a uh, low cost and we obviously want to build in all these extra features into the, uh, the chip. And there could be secondary requirements such as indexation new possibilities uh, you know in terms of sensing and actuation at uh, various uh, you know uh, various uh, environmental quantities and thereby we can build overall miniaturized systems one example uh, another common example is uh, a pressure sensor which essentially has a small chip uh, in the middle which is actually you know packaged uh, by this extra enclosures so that you know the interface is possible and what is inside there could be you know based on the, uh, the fabrication technologies that I have I will just uh, talk during the lectures. And um, you know if you really zoom it out you can you can see some electronics over there and also you know these microfabricated uh, components uh, which are required in sensing the uh, quantity 
it is uh, you know one thing that you can notice at this stage is that although we talk about microsystems once it is packaged it is no more of that order it could be of the, the size the overall size could be of the order of millimeters or even you know a um, centimeter uh, for the overall packaged uh, system but uh, you know one another key aspect that you should notice out of this is that unlike in ICs we need to integrate these moving components into uh, this on the chip and that is really not possible with the conventional IC fabrication approaches. Now, uh, for the microsystems development the the flow that you follow is quite similar to what is done in IC fabrication. We start with the clean wafer and do a series of steps such as deposition uh, and patterning which are, which are done repeatedly and then we use uh, uh, we do sometimes we do wafer bonding and uh, we also uh, and that again can be followed multiple times and ultimately after all these are done we dice we dice them into individual chips and then attach the package and then package them and do that in the uh, the lectures that follow we will essentially focus on the some of these colored blocks whereas the dicing die attach and uh, those steps will be discussed uh, when we discuss uh, packaging of microsystems separately during this program so in uh, in the key differences here are uh, that we make use of etching extensively in uh, the fabrication of microsystems whereas in microelectronics uh, we uh, you know quite often we will be requiring several uh, doping or ion implantation kind of uh, process steps at this stage and uh, you know uh, although we will still have this resist and you know deposition and resist patterning steps cycled even in the IC fabrication. So, these uh, modifications are required and we will see how you know these minor looking modifications would result can be exploited to result in uh, moving components uh, for building microsystems. Uh, let us uh, uh, at this stage let us also compare this uh, fabrication approach to uh, a more popular conventional approach. One example is building a printed circuit board. In a printed circuit, uh, if you have actually seen a fabrication line for a printed circuit board, you know it is done by what is normally called a conveyor belt approach, where onto a bare board each of these components are attached one after the other and you could also probably have seen uh, you know technicians lined up and you know attaching components one by one. Now, in this case the key is that each of these components are attached you know sequentially and this require you know one room around it the space around them for the, so that these could be positioned onto this board and as you could see these are individually handled so you know uh, they you know recur a lot of process a lo lot of steps in, and lot of time and lot of manpower or even mechanical power to build such a boat and that associated with that you know the challenge is that the performance could vary from board to board and hence all the if almost all the boards should be tested for reliability. Whereas, what you have seen in the previous slide we are essentially taking a wafer 
at a time and inside that on that wafer you are building uh, dozens if not hundreds of chips. So, all of them are likely to be identical and actually in industries it is not just one wafer, it is actually a set of wafers are processed uh, simultaneously. So, the variation between one chip to the next is marginal. So, the testing requirements would be minimal, the, uh, the processing would be less complicated as compared to the conventional approaches for system building. Now, let us look at you know how uh, the processes are arranged, how the process, how which are the processes that would be required in building a typical micro system. What you see here is one of the oldest example of building reported for building a micro system in this particular case a pressure sensor. And if you read through the passage over here, uh, what we have is that a, if you see in colored is that a series of process steps. Many of these are you know uh, are used in IC fabrication as such and some of these are you know little tweaked or little modified compared to what is required in IC fabrication. Diffusion is a, a process steps commonly used in IC fabrication in, a, in you know in terms of uh, modifying the dopant level of different of layers. Bonding is rarely used, but it is also is, uh, is rarely used in IC fabrication, but is you know highly required in many micro systems. Polishing steps are once again you know uh, rarely used in micro fabrication. You will see that some of these are very much required in building micro systems. Ion implantation once again is uh, common in IC fabrication, metallization is common, deposition steps and patterning are also common in IC fabrication. But uh, you know what really uh, stands out here is that there is a etching step here which is required to you know for creating the diaphragm that is required in the case of a pressure sensor. So, uh, we will see how some of these process steps are, uh, are arranged and are performed to build micro systems such as this. Uh, it is also uh, uh, necessary to have a cursory look at some of the technologies that are involved. Lithography is essentially the patterning technique that are followed in many uh, ICs. Nowadays, there are uh, more advanced techniques such as lift off used in lithography and uh, in patterning in ICs. And it is also possible to use either of these to pattern a small layer in micro systems. It is possible to use a wet chemistry based or even a dry etching and dry process steps to etch various layers uh, in order to pattern them in my building micro systems and which is very similar to that is there in IC fabrication. Another process, tech, another technology that is uh, used in building ICs as well as in microsystems is vacuum technology. It provides cleanliness and it provides an, uh, an environment in which materials could be transferred from one to another in uh, ensuring you know purity without contamination and this essentially help in uh, realizing repeatable fabrication processes. Another key uh, process that is uh, used in micro fabrication as well as in IC fabrication is plasma technology. This 
is required in many of the deposition processes and it is also used in many of the etching approaches. So, essentially you know what we require is process technologies that would allow selective etching and deposition of uh, different layers. It is also sometimes it is also required to have you know work with chemistry so that the surface uh, properties could be modified so that you know the addition between layers could be improved and also in terms of you know changing their morphology. A large number of materials could be used for the fabrication of MEMS and micro systems. We can start with a substrate which is essentially the support material and you know on which we are building these chips. In ICs, we are always bound with what is uh, the semiconductors, uh, with semiconductor substrates. But in many microsystems, the substrate by itself is only a support material and hence need not necessarily be a semiconductor. So, we can even think of glass or plastic substrates for building microsystems especially those do not require on chip integration with electronics. The fabrication of most uh, let us say uh, most of these uh, microsystems would require working with thin films as I mentioned depositing them and patterning them sequentially. And one of the final steps in building microsystems is uh, you know packaging the individual dies and various materials are used in packaging and which is also which is similar to the case of uh, integrated circuits. Now, if you look at individual materials that are used, uh, we can think we can look at various semiconductor materials for the substrate uh, such a, and as you could see from here and based on the uh, lectures elsewhere, you will see that silicon by far is the most widely used material as a substrate material for uh, microsystems as obviously in the case of integrated circuits for various reasons as you will see later in this lecture. There are all these uh, you know metallic and non-metallic uh, materials used as uh, thin films in building microsystems. So, uh, let us now look at them in you know from a different perspective. The substrate materials are uh, used as I mentioned primarily for the mechanical support. It is uh, as I said when there is in electronics to be integrated, the, if it is a semiconductor substrate it provides the compatibility with the you know with the electronic electronics that are there. Uh, thin films are essentially required in building those structural members that could possibly be moving. Uh, thin films are required from the IC perspective uh, are required from the uh, dielectric properties, semiconductor properties and conducting properties. So, we have all these kinds of thin film materials and from the IC, uh, from the MEMS perspective, from the microsystems perspective, this could even be you know what is called structural materials. We will talk about these again a little later. Uh, thin film materials as you could see uh, can have multiple functions. For example, in the from the microsystems perspective, some of them could be for a structural aspect whereas, from the electronics perspective these same thin films could be working as dielectrics. Again we will see them uh, in action little later. 
as I mentioned, the most uh, popular substrate material is silicon. Uh, silicon in has very good mechanical properties in addition to its electronics properties and because of that it is widely used. And obviously, this is a semiconductor material and hence integrating electronics is easier if you use uh, silicon as a substrate material. All, uh, and I suppose all of you know that its electrical properties could be changed by adding dopants and with which you can even change the resistance or the res surface resistivity of that. You get various types of silicon wafer and you could choose these uh, based on the requirement. The silicon wafer you know and you know it usually it also the, the type the grade also decides the cost of the wafer. It is also possible these days to get what are called SOI wafers silicon on insulated wafers which are essentially processed wafers. Uh, and are used widely these days for many microsystems requirement. Silicon is a crystalline material. This has basically atoms arranged in a particular order and this order is essentially repeated all over the crystalline uh, wafer that is available to us that we can purchase commercially. Uh, it belongs to what is called this Singblend classification of uh, crystal structure. It is silicon as you may know has uh, you know 4 electrons in the outer band and hence has 4 covalent bonds and these essentially help in terms of arranging these atoms uh, tetrahedrally within this crystal. Let us now look at how uh, crystalline geometries could be studied in you know especially in the context of uh, this silicon. One of the approaches for that is based on what is called Miller indices and this is done basically by identifying a plane or a direction and it is this uh, Miller indices are used for this purpose. The some conventions used in this basically if you use square brackets it, it, it specifies a particular direction and if you use simple bracket it specifies the plane. And if you use angled bracket, it means essentially a family of equivalent directions. I will talk about it a little later. Similarly, if you use braces, it, it, mean, it indicates a family of equivalent planes. Uh, for example, uh, what could be termed as 1 0 0, 0 1 0 or 0 0 1 are all crystallographically equivalent. We will see what are these and these could actually be represented with a 1 0 0 within angle bracket. Uh, you will see that a bar placed above this index uh, it is used to uh, indicate a minus sign in a specifying the crystal direction. First, let us see what is uh, some of these crystal directions that are commonly used. Assume that you have a, a coordinate uh, a play, a coordinate axis x y z axis defined and as you could see from the uh, figure on the left uh, a plane uh, which is parallel to any of those axes could be in fact called what is called a, a 1 0 0 plane. A plane which is pa parallel diagonal to 2 of those axes and parallel to 1 is typically called a 1 1 0 plane and 
a plane which is not parallel to any one of those axes as you could see from the third figure here is a 1 1 1 plane and let us see a little bit more what these are based on the definitions of Miller indices. What you normally do to define Miller indices is to find out the intercepts of the plane with the coordinate x, y, z axis and let us say that a 1, a 2, a 3 are these intercepts. We take the reciprocals of these numbers essentially to avoid infinities and then find the LCM and then you know uh, multiply with this LCM to get the Miller indices for uh, the particular plane. For example, if you have a plane which is intercepting with uh, 2, 4 and 4 uh, with respect to the x, y, z axis, we can choose the numbers 2, 4 and 4 from this example and in the, for in the first step we could write 1 by 2 because we, I have, we need to take the reciprocals. So, we take 1 by 2, 1 by 4 and 1 by 4 and the LCM is essentially 4. So, we multiply by 4 and we get the Miller indices as 2, 1 and 1. So, this is essentially a plane that it is intercepting with these points of on the coordinate axis is, is called a 2, 1, 1 plane. So, similarly when it is intercepting with a you know only let us say x axis at point uh, 1, 0, 0 and if it is parallel to y and z axis you can work out the process steps. I mean the uh, steps that are discussed here and we can find out that it is one of those uh, planes that you saw in the first example in the previous slide. It is also possible that you know any if even if it is intercepting with 0 1 0 or 0 0 1 uh, with respect to the x y z axis it is uh, you know these are all parallel to one of those axes. So, when the atoms are arranged in a cubic fashion it does not matter whether it is parallel to the x axis or y axis or z axis. Hence, all these are you know essentially uh, identical in this particular context and that is why in the previous slide we have seen all these are crystallographically identical and we collectively uh, call them a 1 0 0 or similarly in other cases. So, it, uh, there here is one more example. Let us say that we have intercepts at uh, points 2 3 4 and you can work out, we can find the intercept point uh, points and we can find the reciprocals and find the LCM and you can find that you know the resulting uh, Miller indices are like this. So, going back it is possible that atomic uh, you know the surface of the wafer is aligned with any one of these planes when you purchase them and hence the wafers are I mean these are these different types are there. Now, why is it? why is it that we have all these different types of wafers and what makes the difference. As I mentioned in the case of silicon it is essentially a zinc blend uh, structure which is essential which is consisting of two cubic lattices which are essentially interpenetrating FCCs. So, in the example in the schematic here the uh, three atoms from one of the cubic the uh, are cubic is marked with this uh, black darkened uh, circles and some of the atoms from the second interpenetrating uh, FCC are marked with this hollow circles over here. Uh, the, so, uh, 
uh, if you actually look at one unit cell with side A, you will see that there are all these eight atoms coming from the uh, from the corners of that unit cell. There are six atoms at its uh, FCC. So, essentially this set belong to one full uh, cubic cell and then there are these additional four atoms shown with these hollow circles over here, which are coming from the second uh, interpenetrated uh, lattice. So, altogether in a cell a cube of cube of side A, we can have uh, 18 uh, atoms in the case of silicon. And now, if you try to slice these crystals along let us say the um, 1 0 0 plane or uh, 1 1 0 plane, obviously the atoms on the surface could be different. As you could see, it is ro not rotationally symmetric. Hence, the properties of silicon could be different and it is also different when you approach it in different directions. So, the chemical properties, the surface properties of silicon wafers could be different based on the directions, the crystal directions and hence in many cases you will see that the silicon properties are anisotropic. In fact, in building many microsystems we make use of this anisotropy in building useful microsystems. So, here is uh, the example of what I said. If you take 1 0 0 wafer and if you see surface atoms, you will see that in any one surface, you will have these different atoms coming from the uh, you know from the surface belonging to this lattice. And there are essentially five atoms come in one unit cell. Whereas, if you see a 1 0 0 or oh, sorry 1 1 0 um, wafer surf, 1 1 0 surface, you will see that the all these atoms are on the surface of a 1 0 0 wafer. And similarly, in the case of 1 1 1 wafer, you will see that there are these six atoms on the surface belonging to one unit cell. All the other atoms are essentially within below the unit cell and these are essentially linked to it and these are strongly bonded. And as you could see from here, the, the surface of the 1 1 1 has you know it is very strongly bonded to the atoms inside and hence it is very difficult to displace them and you will see that again as I mentioned that these properties are made use of in processing the silicon uh, wafers conveniently for building microsystems. <coughs> for the uh, identifying the silicon wafers with uh, different uh, uh, crystal orientations and different uh, doping types, some convention is, fo is followed. This is essentially true for wafers with a small diameter, uh, which are typically used in university labs. For larger wafers, which are used in you know industrial foundries, these conventions are not typically followed. And as you could see that we what we have is essentially these prime uh, these two flats. So, it is although we normally indicate a wafer with a full circle, it is not so these have two small you know flat edges which is slightly difficult to see from the images here, but still you know with different dimensions and different relative locations and that are essentially used in identifying the type of the wafer uh, when you have one with you. 
the fabrication of uh, silicon wafer, although we hardly follow those in a university lab, we almost always buy the uh, silicon wafer from and the vendors, but still it is interesting to see how you can get that silicon wafer out of silica. So, we you know have the, the a series of process steps essentially uh, you know followed to build a single crystal uh, um, um, which is you know fashioned Yes, it's almost like a cylinder and essentially run through a series of steps further to finally result in a, a completely flat wafer. So, in a, it is essentially by melting the, uh, the silica or, or which is essentially high purity sand that you get this silicon as a source material. And it is cri absolutely critical that at this stage itself, the crystal orientation of the silicon is defined. And further on, it is essentially shaped, it is made into and these flats that I indicated are engraved on it and further it is sliced into these individual wafers and polished to mirror finish as you probably have seen some of them and then you know inspected and provided to uh, us for processing those for building various microsystems and uh, you know um, ISIS. Um, apart from the mechanical and the electrical properties that we have, uh, what we uh, know in the case of silicon, it also has some very interesting properties which could be exploited in the context of microsystems. It it's, exhibits a, a sensory property called piezo piezoresistivity. That is, you know by applying a stress, the resistance could be varied. It has very good thermal characteristics. It also has some optical properties you must be familiar with photodiodes and other devices made of silica. So, because of some of these additional features, many more microsystems could be built on silicon than that are possible in you know other uh, substrate materials. Hence, silicon is the most widely used substrate material in microsystems. Yet, silicon is not the only material. There are instances when you really need to build a large area device and then you know silicon is probably not the best uh, suited material. And it is also you know uh, instances when we the production volume is not large enough to go through the process steps that I have you know briefly indicated previously. And then also cases where you know electronics need not be integrated on chip. So, in such cases, non silicon materials could be used for building microsystems. One of the uh, other popular substrate material, again a semiconductor material, is gallium arsenide. Uh, it has uh, you know particular advantages, especially for building radio frequency and some optical grade uh, uh, devices. It also has some disadvantages, uh, you know, especially in terms of building, you know, thin films on it and also processing at uh, high temperatures and, you know, building truly mechanical components. Uh, there are options such as glass and even plastics that could be used for building 
microsystems. Uh, so, we could you know at a higher level we could compare the performance of these substrate materials. As you could imagine a plastic or a glass based uh, substrate material will have very low cost uh, compared to silicon. Ceramic material cost although it is indicated as medium here it could actually you know range from you know medium to in fact extremely high based on the quality of the ceramic material that you may want to choose. Metallization properties are typically good for uh, silicon and glass and usually it is you know a little difficult to deposit metals onto plastic, but it's, it is still possible. Uh, machinability as you could imagine, machinability is essentially the processing uh, uh, to shape uh, different structural parts out of the substrate material. And as you could imagine, it is very good in the case of silicon and you know some of the ceramic materials, it is very difficult to build uh, such you know parts, mechanical parts. So, going forward in the subsequent lectures, what we will see is that how silicon and other substrate materials that you have you have seen could be started with and how some of these process steps could be done to build really what are called these moving components and you know to so that we can build microsystems. Let me give you a brief overview of how these are done. We essentially want a, a film or a part of the substrate which could be left in such a way that it is allowed to move or there is some room to move. So, what we need to do is that we need to do extensive you know patterning and etching steps so that this uh, room can be created, the space beneath can be created on the substrate or on the thin film material that you have actually deposited by tweaking the processes. And this uh, is usually done conventionally by two of these approaches indicated here. This is essentially a series of process steps that you see over here uh, organized in such a way that either a thin film or the substrate by itself is uh, processed in to create this three dimensional space around it, so that it could be moved. In surface micro machining as the name indicates, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to uh, machine in a conventional sense trying to chemically process strictly speaking uh, the thin film, so that it has some room beneath it. Think about it, how can we have a room or a space beneath a thin film? A thin film has to be attached to the surface of the substrate. The question is how can we create room beneath it and that is essentially what the beauty of the approach that you will see later. It is what we are trying to do there is that we first deposit a dummy material thin film and then add the film that you really want to retain and selectively remove the film underneath the uh, so that the, the, the dummy material that I mentioned, so that we will be able to 
you know leave the second material, the structural material that we added. So, uh, as you could see, it is very critical that we work with the chemistry of these materials. We understand how some of these materials react to uh, you know chemicals and we identify suitable chemicals. So, that you know it only uh, attacks let us say the dummy material as I indicated here and not the structural material that we would want to add. So, by having these two thin films in addition to the substrate material, we can work on what is called the surface micro machining. So, in surface micro machining what we are doing, what we will try to do is to build a free standing thin film above the substrate. In bulk micro machining on the other hand, we try to dig into the substrate material itself <coughs> and create room there. For example, earlier I talked about a pressure sensor where there was a cavity uh, below a diaphragm membrane. To create such large cavities, it is not enough that we work with a thin film. We probably need several tens of micrometer depth cavities and it is really not possible to build uh, thin films as thick. So, what is done there is to basically you know try to remove the substrate material and by etching and uh, you know so that we can you know create that large cavity the deep cavity below a, a thin wafer, a thin diaphragm. It is usually, so again it is not possible to uh, you know work on the uh, work on the bulk of the substrate material without creating a hole from the open area. And obviously, you know it is not possible essentially to create a cavity like this working from the top side. You will have to work from the back side. So, you know in the case of uh, micro systems usually one would require what are called you know double sided polished wafers. So, that we can process partly from this side and partly from the back side. So, uh, you know what we get here is you know again with the bulk micro machining approach that I indicated what we get here is a open cavity. Now, to create a closed cavity we may want to do uh, steps uh, uh, such as you know adding a separate wafer on the back side and that is done by what is called wafer bonding approaches. So, in wafer bonding what is done is that before the individual dies are uh, separated while the, waf the full wafer is being handled, you are essentially adding multiple or at least two different wafers together in such a way that we can have this kind of closed cavities. So, building closed cavities is possible uh, with you know what is called this wafer bonding approaches. So, in subsequent lectures, we will talk about various approaches for deposition and we will see how patent transfer is performed onto this depositor lace. We will see various approaches for etching and we will see how these are you know organized in such a way that you know we can have freestanding films 
or freestanding substrate parts by surface micro machining or, or bulk micro machining. And then we will also see how you know wafer bonding approaches could be used in building you know closed cavity kind of uh, material uh, uh, devices which involve closed cavities or really thick devices possibly even consisting of different substrate materials. And as I indicated the steps that are listed towards the end which are you know dicing, die attach and uh, you know releasing and all those things uh, and ultimate packaging with respect to electronics will be discussed uh, later in this program uh, and where we will see some examples in which you know devices made microsystems made out of the process steps here are actually attached to various uh, you know the uh, packaging uh, uh, solutions currently available so that it can actually be used uh, uh, for real life applications. So, uh, thank you at this stage and I will come back to you with more details of the process steps that are here. Thank you.